Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www dot read learn live podcast dot com slash audible to start your 30 day free trial today what i see from people is like baseball is slow it's boring it's i don't i you know i want to play basketball or something more to meet or soccer you know i just kick the ball and i'm always running but when you're good at something it's more fun and baseball is very difficult but i can see kids when it clicks when they're like oh I, I know where to go. I know what to do. I, I, I know I can get this kid out with a pitch or I can hit this other kid's pitching. It's more fun. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 73, otherwise known as the highest number of home runs ever hit in a season of baseball by Mr. Barry Bonds in 2001. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured or if authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at j-o-n at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Lee Silber about his book, Jimmy and the Kid. Lee Silber is an author who started self-publishing his books with success in the 1990s. He then signed with Random House for four books, followed by St. Martin's Press, Career Press, and others to release a total of 20 books. Then he went back to putting out his own books, winning several awards, including his latest title, Jimmy and the Kid. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Read, Learn, Live podcast. It is April 2020. And we are all indoors. My name is John Monaster. I am your host, and I am very excited to be here today with Lee Silber, author of Jimmy and the Kid. Lee, say hello. Let's play ball. Let's play ball. <laughs> I like that. You had that one ready. Wow. Um, for those of you uh, listening, which is all of you, uh, Lee is dressed up in his baseball gear, looking great, uh, ready to talk about the game of baseball. Um, so Lee, let's uh, let's just kick this off. Tell me about the book. Tell me about Jimmy and the Kid. Well, this was going to be an answer later, but when I was a yeah. kid, I used to um, kind of go off by myself, and I would I loved yeah. baseball, and I would take a ball and a glove and either take some tape and against the wall, I'd make a strike zone, and I would mm -hmm. pitch, you know, like a complete game. Of course, I'd always and win um but you know i got better at baseball but i also i love that solitary time and, and uh just baseball to me is more than just a sport there's so many lessons to be learned from it and that's why i'm excited to be here yeah so what is what's the book about tell me tell me the s summarize the the narrative of the book here right i didn't i guess i should have tied that together so it starts yeah. with a, a girl who moves to san diego her mom in the military her father unfortunately was killed in afghanistan so when she goes off to work during the summer uh they just moved there in june uh she finds there's a baseball field across the street it's empty uh so she finds a wall and she pitches against the wall and like uh, the guy that maintains the field a much older man drives by and kind of observing and uh you know she didn't have a glove so he gave her a glove uh, he gave her a new ball and each day he would kind of go over and try and get her to uh, you know, want to want to be coached, want to get better, and so she finally agrees. It turns out he's a former baseball uh, Hall of Famer who had retired, and so the two of them form a friendship. And Billy, being a girl, uh, wants to play baseball instead of softball, and that's a very actually literally didn't let girls in until 1974, and there's been mm -hmm. only a few that have been in the Little League World Series, 14 actually. So she becomes this great baseball player but it's much more than that there's a whole other side to the story and a lot of lessons that i tried to mix in like jerry seinfeld's wife puts the vegetables in the spaghetti sauce so you're 
you're eating spaghetti, but you don't know there's vegetables in there. <laughs> right, so it's, a, right. it's an entertaining book with a, an underlying story, which for your listeners, you found all of, of the hidden vegetables, <laughs> as I could tell yeah. when you, uh, as we talked earlier. Yeah, it, it, I like that's an interesting metaphor. I mean, I felt like they weren't necessarily vegetables in that in that, you know, uh, I hate my vegetables or whatever kind of thing. I think they were very thoughtful, you know, lessons. And I think that it's um, it's sort of like a parable. You know, it's got it's got, a, a, you know, that element, that flavor to it. So I think there's yeah, it's told in that in that style. And I like that. So, yeah. So I guess, you know, I, I'm just thinking about the creative process and, and how this all came together. I know that you have written a lot. You're a speaker or a writer. You know, how did you end up on this particular story and decide that, that you really wanted to put together this particular book? So for me, writing nonfiction books, which is kind of my forte, and those seem to be the ones that are the best sellers and mm -hmm. or, or were anyway, and the most in, in demand. I had two books, two ideas for books, and they were good ones and they were they made sense. And it's what I should have done or probably could have done. Um, but they, I just could not get, I'd start and stop and, you know, writer's block for me isn't a problem, but when there's some, for some reason, I just could not go. So I said, well, you know what, what do I really want to write? And I had the story uh, in the background that I uh, came up with and it almost wrote itself. And I think there's a lesson there. Sometimes when you keep hitting up against a wall, maybe it is some time to do something else. And when things come really easy to you, we almost discount them. Well, that was so easy, that little book I wrote. But for me, that was important that I found that project that I I couldn't wait to go back and write, meaning I was excited to sit down and write versus I just couldn't get myself to write. And I knew it was the right thing to do. And as I got started, not knowing exactly how it would end or what it would include, it turned out to be something that I'm very proud of. And I'm glad I did it. Yeah, I think that that makes some sense. It's sort of like the kind of follow your passions idea to some degree. It's like if, if you're if if you care about something, you naturally will be more drawn to it, more excited by it. I think is what you're. you're I don't know. I, I wonder. Sometimes I wonder about that causal relationship, right? Which which comes first? But it sounds like you were able to find that. I mean, what were some of the ones that we, you were hitting a wall about? Well, one of the the things that I think we, we as a writer, you think, well, I should write what people want to read, not what I want to write. But I think mm. what I've discovered is sometimes you just write what you want to write and find an audience for it. Unless it's mm -hmm. poetry, that's a tricky one. Not that there's anything wrong with poetry, it's just hard to sell it. But you take that same yeah. poem, turn it into a song, and then, anyway. But for me, I had a book called, um, which you had, you had a question down that you were thinking of asking me, and it's about compound improvement. And mm -hmm. it, it's compound innovation. So I was taking things that have been around forever, pizza, jeans, paper clips. Why? Why are they still popular? What is it? And it was about little my, changes that made them uh, get better and stay with the times. You know, pizza mm -hmm. was, it came with the GIs came over in after World War II. And it was made by Tony in some pizza place. You know what I'm saying? And then, but little yeah. by little, now the pizza's in the car on its way to your door. Um, and so I, why is, why are certain things still popular? And so that was, that's the, it's still a book I want to write. And then I, another book, I'm a big credit union, uh, advocate and I believe in credit unions and I wanted mm -hmm. to, to get other people to understand as a, let's say you have a, any kind of business. Why are people so loyal to a bank, a banking facility? It seems like an odd thing, but people love their credit unions. I so I love my credit union. So how do you get that kind of experience from for your customers? And so mm -hmm. uh, the, the lessons that credit, what credit unions do to create loyalty and, and uh, lifelong customers. And well, I'm giving away all my book ideas. <laughs> and then, and then, <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. We won't. We won't. We won't uh, don't worry. And how to no, apply no. them? <laughs> yeah, you're right. No so you ideas. Go. Ideas are easy. Execution is hard. Right. This is a, this is what I've heard. So okay. Um, one of the things that I picked up on is that, well, one of the things that, that shouted at me perhaps was the front of the book. And it says it's a short novel for all ages. So, you know, because a lot of times people try and market their book by segments. I'm in the young adults. I'm in the, you know, teen, whatever it is. So when you say it's a short novel, but it's for all ages, 
What did you mean? Well, I have kids, so obviously I think it's nice when my kids can read my book. My last book was not for all ages, and it was not a happy, mm. dippity story. It was it was very dark. Um, mm. So I wanted something that would, you know, my kids could read. Uh, I also feel like the short part, people, when they see a fat book, they're like, I don't have, this is pre what we're going through now, but I don't have time for that. Yeah. You know, give me a, short, a shorter book, something I could read in maybe a day or two. That's what I really yeah. want. And so, you know, and for a writer, you know, you, you cut the fluff, you know, you let the reader just imagine on their own certain scenes and certain, you know, things that a lot of writers will just describe in great detail. So it really is, for me, if it doesn't move the plot along in this, in this book, or it doesn't, there's not some real reason that's in there, I got rid of it. So I kept it to, you know, 120 pages, which is a, for some people, one, one sitting or a couple, couple days. So it's a short and easy to read book. And then for all ages, I felt like, you know, it's, I don't, profanity, I don't need it. I mean, unless it's a crime story or something, it didn't need to have that in it. So that eliminated that. Didn't need any, mm -hmm. any kind of uncomfortable, gratuitous sex. I mean, just, it, it just felt like it could be a, it could appeal to an adult. It could appeal to a young adult and even a preteen. It's that kind of story. Sure. It's a story I and mean, it's, it's a heartwarming story. That's a tragedy in it. But in the end of the day, there's nothing in there that would offend anybody. And that's how yeah. we are today. I mean, I've written things where people would write me, how could you use that word? One word would offend me. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I think it does that nicely too. And I, and I agree, it's helpful sometimes, especially when it comes to page length. I'm always, like, I'm just kind of an obsessive reader. So I, I like, whatever, it's fine for me. But I'm always surprised by people that, as soon as I talk to them about a book, want to know how long it is. Mm, interesting. You know, they, they want to know. They want to know what they're getting into. What kind of a commitment is it going to be? Um, so. So my book's like a, you know. a one night stand. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's very easy. Just go. Just read it. You're done. You move on. You've hopefully taken some lessons. Uh, good. That's the sale. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, let's talk. Let's talk about the book. So you you mentioned there at the beginning we've got we've got you know Jimmy and the kid. So Jimmy is Jimmy, the kid is Billy. So when we first meet these characters, you know who who are they and kind of where are they at their lives? Well, Billy is um, as she likes to say almost thirteen, which in little league age you you go up to thirteen and then you move on to uh, you, you know you play in your junior high or whatever. So it's kind of the the, the top of the age bracket um so she's she's just turning 13 he is in his 80s he played for the twins um and retired in the 60s i based it on a character named harman killebrew uh just so i would have some reference of how tall he was and how you know, stat, his stats and kind of some of the who he played with and kind of use that as the basis of the character so he's much older at the end i, I don't want to give too much away but in the yeah, end yeah. he well I, why not i mean he knows he's dying. He's got cancer. He knows he's dying. And he's just kind of, it's the end of his life. But Billy is so young and vibrant, and so willing and so into baseball. It kind of, it, it gives him extra months of his life. He's so thrilled. Mm -hmm. And if there's a lesson there, it's that we we all could benefit from a mentor. Someone who's been there, done that, knows what's what to expect, knows what not to do. You know, that's just as much as of importance as what to do sure. and what we think well i don't want to ask you know i seems like such a bird and i want such a this guy's got other or this gal's got other things going on but mentors want to give back that's the yeah. thing they love to they want to share they want to teach they maybe even have guilt about their success <laughs> you could ease their guilt so um he asked her if she would like to be coached but we can always ask for coaching if we need it and accept it when it's offered it's a big step in the right direction of our careers to have some, it's a shortcut really to where we want to go. Someone has already gone that path and knows which pitfalls are in the way and, you know, which detours not to take or which ones are shortcuts. And so mentors are, are something that I think help us in life and in our careers. Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, what I remember from the book is that maybe Jimmy to a lot of other people was just the kind of the guy the groundskeeper, just somebody, you know, some people, a lot of people didn't even know who he was. Some people did, but it was a secret. 
I mean, I guess, what do you think sort of drew them to each other? What what made Jimmy feel like, oh, this girl's special. I want to, you know, mentor her. I think before I get to that, I think yeah, they're both lonely. You know, statistics mm-hmm. show that even though we're more connected than ever, a lot of people, and especially that generation, which would be the, so it's Gen Y and it's Gen, it's Gen Y. Is it? X, Y, Z. It's Gen Z. She would be Gen Z. Yeah, there you go. Uh, That's it, right? We're at the end of the alphabet. That should be the end of this nonsense of X, Y, Z. But anyway. Right, right. Are we going to double A next? Yeah. She's Gen Gen Y. And even though they are, you know, connected in many ways that we weren't, uh, if we're a little bit older, statistics show that they're lonely. And a lot of seniors are lonely. So he was there on his ride on mower just maintaining the fields, even though he, you know, was a Hall of Fame baseball player. Uh, he just loved to do that, and it kept him busy, but he was still alone. She, her mom was gone. Her dad has died. She's um, home alone. She sees this empty baseball field, but she's throwing the ball against the wall alone. Um, but that but that bringing the two lonely people together, I thought, was something um, that was important. I don't know if there was a lesson there, but it turned there is, as you go through the book, down the road but it was something that struck me as um you know we see you know we see uh, a lot of uh, military families move into san diego and it's hard Mm -hmm. for them because maybe in a year they're going to move again so they don't necessarily make deep friendships uh they don't have lasting friendships and so sometimes as someone like billy who had moved so many times she doesn't even bother she's just i'm not going to bother to make a friend um but in the of course again with the story she ends up making some really good friends yeah and and you know there's that idea where she kind of she went across the street she happened to run into this guy it happened to work out and then um you know she wanted to start practicing in a serious way and so it's like these pieces start falling into place for her but then she encounters another roadblock right i think this is sort of emblematic just of you know both Billy in the book, and she's constantly encountering Roblox. She has to fight her way through. Um, but also, it's just us in life, right? We're, we're constantly hitting walls. We keep having to keep moving forward. And one thing I thought was interesting was that she, her, her mom kind of said, well, I don't want you going out there and doing that, like, you know, just being that protective kind of mom. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're connected back to their family because she realized, oh, this is this person that I actually, you know, have a connection to Jimmy, you know, Jimmy Parks from the twins, like, oh gosh, like our whole thing, you know, that your dad loved him and there was this big connection. And, and so it's just, I, I feel like it's interesting because she had to push to get there and then ended up being a little lucky. And that sort of lucky break ended up, you know, turn obviously changing the story and turning it in a different direction. And, you know, making a lot of other things work out as we get further along in the story and and find out more about, you know, her mom and all that stuff. So I guess kind of what what I try and think about here is like, how how do we think about luck to some degree? Because, you know, it seems like part of the story was determination and, and making an effort and part of it and some, some part of it was luck. And so how can we think about, you know, how to manage the impact of luck, I guess, in our lives? Well, she, she, her life would have been, the book wraps it all up as she becomes yeah. a, a, an adult. Um, so she's 13 in the bulk of the story, uh, but in the epilogue it explains what had happened to her. And mm-hmm. she took a chance and she went against the trends and she, she put herself out there in a way that probably wasn't the easiest way. Meaning there was a girls softball league just up the road. There was, a, uh, her mom was encouraging her, go meet some friends, some other girls and go, you know, go ride your bikes and be, you know, do girl stuff. And instead she's like, nope, I want to play baseball with the boys. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of pushback. Uh, even in today's world, my, my son um, plays on a team with one girl and maybe, in, and I've been coaching for my 11th year. Um, I maybe seen two girls playing boys baseball, both very mm-hmm. good, but it's not, it's it's got to be difficult to to want to do that. What do your girlfriends say? What how is it interacting with you know all these thirteen year old boys and um, you know all the people thinking you can't do it? And yet, mm-hmm. so she she 
the, the question is, how do you get, how do you get luck? How does luck come into your life? It's sometimes it is by just putting yourself out there in the path of something that can push you to the next step and that can help you. Whereas if mm. you just took the easy way or you didn't do anything or you were afraid, put yourself out there and good things will happen. It's, that's how I look at it. Yeah, I, th I think so too. I think that's, uh, that's an important lesson to be reminded of that uh, e even as you, you know, will will hit setbacks. You have to keep putting yourself out there. The luck won't find you otherwise. Yeah, if you're moving in a, in a direction towards your dream, people and things will come along to help you. I know it sounds cool. I'm from California. Woo! -hoo! <laughs> yeah, but it it just I've seen it happen so many times, and that's why I included it in the book. Where, um, yeah, Jimmy Parks just happens to be there, but when he offers to help her in the beginning, she's a little reluctant. And if mm -hmm. if he wasn't more persistent, and she didn't finally acquiesce and say, all right, I'll let you coach me. I'm a great pitcher, but our good pitcher, but I don't know how to right. hit. And Jimmy was known for his hitting. It was a perfect fit. Sometimes I forget yeah, yeah. this is fiction because it, it seems so to me anyway, like this really happened. I got to watch that. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and then, you know, so, so as the story progresses, she, uh, she meets Bobby kind of a friend and she meets these other kids that are playing, playing baseball. And, her and Bobby work uh, real hard over the summer with Jimmy, and they really practice constantly every day. They're on the field, and you know they they get a lot better, and and are kind of ready. And you know that's I, I was really impressed by that. You know, it's one of those things where it's incremental improvement ends up making a big difference. And I think you know at least for me, often it can be very difficult to commit to doing something like that because. Because just because you're not seeing the, the, that you don't have that instant gratification that that maybe we've come to expect with a lot of things. So, you know, how can we how can we get ourselves motivated? You know, if we know that you know, there is a good end goal that we're working towards, but, you know, day in, day out, it's going to be hard to see that kind of leap that we might be hoping for. Wow. Well, um, there's so many ways I can answer that. The one thing that's, that struck me um, as a coach is there were kids mm -hmm. that would stay after practice. Hey, hit me some more grounders. There were kids that say, hey, coach, why aren't we practicing on Friday? They wanted to practice. Can we do an extra mm -hmm. hitting session, just you and me? Um, and so you, the kids that want, they knew to get where they wanted to go, they needed to get better. And there are kids that even at 13 or 14 think, I know it all. I know how to hit. I know how to, and then there's kids that are willing to listen and learn. That's the two characters who are like that. Yeah. They listen and learn. And then there's um, other people that, you know, they just know that repetition in a you know, positive way will create muscle memory and create in baseball anyway. It, you know, it just, you get smoother. It just comes easier. The game slows down for you, meaning it can seem overwhelming, but the more you've done it, the more you've been in that situation, the more you practice it, the easier it gets. And when I, what I see from people is like baseball is slow. It's boring. It's, I don't, I, you know, I want to play basketball or something more immediate or soccer. You know, I just kick the ball and I'm always running, but when yeah. you're good at something, it's more fun. And baseball mm. is very difficult, but I can see kids when it clicks, when they're like, Oh, I, I, I know where to go. I know what to do. I, I, I know I can get this kid out with a pitch or I can hit this other kids pitching. It's more fun. Um, and the other thing is, I think it was Stephen Covey who said, you need to sharpen your saw. And what he meant by that is it gets dull over time. And so mm -hmm. even though maybe you already have some success or you've gone to college, and, you know, that's in the rear view mirror, we still need to continue to learn, grow and, and practice and get better. And that's the sharpening of the saw. And so unfortunately, or fortunately, we have some of us have the time to maybe spend some time practicing, learning, improving. Um, kind of like the book I was talking about, it's compound improvement with baseball. Once, yeah. you know, you can't just leapfrog from, I just learned how to play to I'm a great player. There's little steps in the way and each one is important to get to where you are great. Yeah. And, and as you're doing that, you know, like you said, you're staying for that extra batting session or working on your pitches or whatever, but as you're practicing, I think, uh, doing that sort of thing, that's on your own. And that's obviously different than playing the game of baseball, which is this big kind of team sport. So well, let me add something there for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a coach and 
the, and I wrote this book, there's a lot of lessons in there for young baseball players and young athletes. But one of the things mm-hmm. is practice is where you learn and the games are the reward. The ga- you don't learn, mm-hmm. you learn some of the games, but it's the practices that are much more important where well, that's where the instruction happens. Whereas the game, like during the middle of a game, I'm not going to pull a kid aside and say, Hey, you know, you need to work on this fundamental, that fundamental. It's too late. The games we're in the middle yeah. of a game. So practices is, is where kids get better. If you watch major leaguers and they go to spring training, someone who's been in league 10 years, they're still doing these simple basic drills because it's that important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you had this line that I liked about what it means to be a good teammate, respect and ribbing. Um, and I think you could kind of derive a lot from just those two words. I mean, you know, why are both of those so important and, and how are they connected? Not everyone can rib properly. <laughs> Sometimes it, yeah, goes, it goes right. too far, but, but done right, it shows that you care, <laughs> right? I cared mm-hmm. enough to rib you a little in a, in a very lighthearted kind of way. And it's that, that camaraderie, that joking, you're, your teammates, but your your friends, you're you know you're in it to win it, but you're also you know at the end of the day, when in, at least in little league and other things, like the game would end, the teams would one team would lose, and they'd just be off playing with you know their teammates. It didn't even matter, right? You know their their friends. Yeah, friendship was a huge thing, and so in sports, you'll see teams that are built with all these superstars that don't get along. You know, mm-hmm. they're all they all think they're the best. So they don't respect somebody else who maybe does the small things that help you win games. In baseball, you see a guy hit, uh, you know, into a grounder that, you know, he's out, but he moved the runner along. So he got the runner closer to scoring. You'll see him come off the field and they'll cheer him. And, you know, he might not be the best hitter, but he knows how to get do the little things. That's just as valuable as a guy that hits a home run every 10 at bats. So um, if you respect your teammates, you get the respect back and, um, and respect doesn't mean only for the best of players. It's for ev- looking for something to respect in everyone. And also, I would say, um, in addition to ribbing and respect, it's uh, it's important that um, you know when someone makes a mistake in baseball, the easy thing is, especially if you're better than that person, come on, man, you should have had that. What are you doing? And then I always feel like if you do that to someone, that they're going to make another error or do another thing poorly because of their mindset is they feel bad so i always yeah. say look you if you have nothing good to say say nothing at all but you always can find something good to say and that is hey you'll get it next time remember you're you're good you're a good player it's no big deal we'll we'll, we'll pick you up that goes a long way to helping that player yeah. help you win because he's he or she isn't going to um be hanging their head be thinking about what they did they, they know that you have their back and of course they would expect the same from you but it's such a different experience when players pull for each other versus yeah. their individuals all on the same team. I know I went way longer on that answer, but uh, I'm passionate no, think- about that, about not getting down on somebody when they make a mistake. It's not everybody gets a trophy. I'm not, I don't believe that, but I do believe right. everybody should be given positive reinforcement when they're doing something right. And if there's something that needs to be corrected, that's on the coach. But as a mm-hmm. teammate, you're there to support them Built, prop them up when they're, they're down and, and make them feel good about who they are and what they do. Yeah, I, I very much agree. And, you know, it's interesting as I, I manage people, um, at kind of, I have sort of a, your typical office job or whatever, and I'm managing people. And, you know, I think it's the same kind of idea where when somebody messes up, you don't want to just say you messed up, you know, you should have done better. I think that it's important, at least the, the way that I think about it is that you think about the effort. You know, it's like if somebody is putting in strong effort, that says a lot to me. That says they're trying and they care. And if they're willing to learn, then I can help them learn and be better and grow and do it better the next time. And that's okay. And they'll eventually get there. Whereas the bigger problem is for me, if they're not putting in effort, if they're just half-heartedly turning something in and it's barely any good or whatever, and they're not willing to take feedback and to grow and learn, that's a problem. So it's, yeah, it's not necessarily the output. It's it's how they got there and whether they are willing to improve that process along that, that I think about too. Wow. I totally agree with that. That's, that's, that's probably, it makes you a super leader. So I'm giving you <laughs> a, pat, a virtual pat on the back. Thank you. I'll take it.
maybe we'll bring people a little bit up on the on the story here, right? So the team is doing well and winning, and they get a chance to, uh, but but then all of a sudden they sort of falter a little bit. They're slacking off a little, and uh, the coaches have this kind of sneaky idea, and they bring the kids over to this kind of college team, and they have a college coach, and he's sort of real tough on everyone, and you know, forces them to get their act together, tuck in their shirts, you know, run places, really respect the practice a bit more and respect the game a bit more. And uh, there's this line that the college coach said that I liked, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Um, you know, what? I, I, so I guess I wanted to ask you, you know, how do you think about that continuous improvement? You know, how, how, are you, how do you think about measuring yourself and why is it so important to always be getting better? So the the team was losing because the kids thought they were, you know, they were this super team or they, whatever. They just weren't focused and they mm-hmm. weren't respecting the game. During the game, they were joking and they weren't paying attention. I mean, the good teams, they're up, they're always learning something about the other team by watching them play. These kids were just talking about school and blah, blah, blah. And so the coach, which I did the same exact thing with my team, took them to see what it takes to play at a higher level. And if some of these kids envision themselves as playing at, at college or high school, then college, and I'm sure in the back of every kid's mind is the big league someday. Right. So the idea was to show them what it takes to get there. And by watching kid, you know, the kids are 13, so they're five foot maybe. Four, five, four and a half feet to five feet tall. These are tall kids, and they see them doing the same drills they do, and they're seeing them, you know, not goofing off. They're focused. You know, all the things we we talked about: positive focus. Um, Coach Chris Brown is a real person who really runs a a program where he gets kids on, that couldn't that are talented enough to play at a four year college, but there's something either it's their grades, their behavior, or something isn't quite there, and so they're with him for a year so he could straighten them out and then they go on and have, you know, back to a, a four-year college. And so he's, that's why he's mm-hmm. strict. He, what some people need is discipline. It sounds strange, but so, you know, I'm the fun coach, but I always partner with another coach who's the bad cop and mm. structure and discipline. It sounds like you, people think they don't want it and don't need it in the workplace in sports, but it's the parameters, the, the knowing what to expect the knowing what you can't get away with. It kind of, yeah. it, it, I don't know how to explain it, but it, discipline is desired beyond what people think. You, you know, the goof off is just waiting for someone to tell them to stop it. And hey, and if, you know, everyone else is behaving and doing what they're supposed to do and is focused and is working together, it makes them see, I don't know, it, there's always that one in the office or in the, in the, on, the, on, the on the bench in the team that's, you know, the class clown. And so um, that's, that's fun. It keeps the team light, but it's detrimental during practices where I got to spend time disciplining that person and pulling them aside. So when you, when you create structure and discipline, as much as it seems like, Oh, that's the last thing I want in the world. People desire it, need it and want it. I I know it sounds counterintuitive, but that's what I have found. Yeah. It makes some sense. I mean, it, it just goes into the idea that, you know, you can, people, People want to enjoy themselves and they want to focus. They want to do good work, but they need to know what that is. They need to know what they're supposed to be working towards and what the parameters are there. It's like, it's like the idea, you know, you can have a lot of fun in the sandbox, but you have to know, you know, what the dimensions are. You have to know where, what you're allowed to do, where, what you're allowed to play in. Yeah. And before games, I used to always try and mix it up. So every warm up would be different, try and keep it mm-hmm. fresh. And, you know, you're, you didn't know what to expect and, you know, it was light. I tried to keep it light. And you know what? It, it didn't really work as well as what Coach Brown did is like the, when everyone showed up, they knew exactly what they did first, second, and third before a game. It, they could do it without even him being there. And they worked together to do that versus waiting for me to tell them, okay, next we're going to do this. And so I kind of mm-hmm. adapted his philosophy, like you said, about structure that, hey, this is what I expect. You show up, you know, you you stretch, you you throw, you know, we do a couple these these three or four drills. And then we prepare ourselves to play. And it worked. It worked like a charm. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so, you know, towards the end of the book, we, you know, we're getting 
toward we're getting in the playoffs, the team's competing for the championship, things are getting serious. And, uh, you know, Billy starts to get hit with kind of, again, these, these, these roadblocks and these, these negatives. And so these, especially these back-to-back kind of hardships that happen really quickly in the book, uh, you know, we're, so we sort of spoiled a little bit here, but if, you, if you're going to read, you can, you know, maybe sk- skip here. But uh, her mother is telling her they'd have to move for a promotion, and, and then Jimmy passes away. And, you know, the, all of these cities are both very traumatic moments in her life. Um, so I guess, you know, how does, how does Billy handle that? How do we think about the right sort of like the initial, like, I just found out something bad. And then how do I process that and think through that and, and connect that with who I knew I was before that and who I will be going forward? Well, there's two, two aspects of this. One is, yeah, this sounds so woohoo, but um, <laughs> you just got to know everything happens for a reason and, and trust that mm. things are going to be okay. And so losing um, her now friend and mentor and father figure and grandfather figure, that was a huge loss. And then, um, you know, for what, what with being in the military, you know, the constant moving, you know, every once in a while. And in this case, you find your forever home. And San Diego was where she really was as happy she'd ever been in her life. And so to find that mm-hmm. she might have to move. So with that, she said, well, what can I do? So she, she said, well, what if you, you know, retired and we found you, you did a consulting that she was trying to help her mom in the sense of helping herself to stay. Mm-hmm. Um, and it didn't work. Her mom said, you know, we can't afford to live her on a military salary. You know, we get housing now and so it's, it just wouldn't work. And then, you know, by, by losing uh, her mentor, she thought, well, that's the end of my, you know, how am I going to continue it without my, my, uh, my favorite coach. But uh, again, without giving away the ending of the book, things worked themselves out in a way that no one would expect, but she just kept going. And because she kept playing, because she kept, um, you know, she never accepted the fact that she would have to move. She just figured we'll find a way. And so she kept uh, just moving forward. Things again came into her life that, that changed her life and uh, created a whole different uh, out, uh, future for her. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess just to kind of wrap up a bit, are there any other big ideas or themes or anything else you hoped people would take away from this that we haven't gotten a chance to talk about yet? Um, a big part of the book is about, uh, spectators and, and parents and, mm. and how, <laughs> how to not watch a youth sporting event and how involved parents get in the, their kids' um, games and, and individual performances. And um, for, for me, anyway, I've seen the worst of what can happen when uh, parents are in the stands. And so I just wanted to, you know, kind of point that out of how, how, how you're supposed to behave. Um, and, and I, I mean, that was to me like how an umpire is, you know, should get the ultimate respect, even though, mm-hmm. you know, they're not, we're not, we don't come to watch the umpire. We come to watch the baseball game, but they, they you know, they make it like we were talking about some rules and some discipline and some, some parameters. Um, so that was, that was something that I wanted to put in. I don't know how that applies mm-hmm. to, to life in general, but it was, it was important to me because I've seen it where, you know, um, the kids, they were, the parents ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> for the kids yeah. in a lot of ways you know one thing i always said um after a game even like my kid maybe got a couple hits but then he struck out at a key moment the temptation is on the way home to say you know you know what were you thinking there you know why why did you look at two strikes in a row and then swung at a bad you know instead of like i love to watch you play yeah not the time to berate someone to belittle them to bring them down it's just I love watching you play. They know, they know they should have done better. You know, I, there's no need for a parent to, to bring a kid down in my opinion. And I thought that was important. Um, and as a leader, I think, yeah, I think that those lessons apply in in a lot of ways. Um, whether it's, you know, parents in the stands, uh, or parents on, you know, driving the kid home or whatever. 
uh, you know, whenever parents are engaging with their children, I think it's the same sort of principles can apply there where you'd hope that they would, again, be happy that and, and be excited by their child's effort and and determination and grit and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's not, yeah, you're not doing it here because, you know, it's it's the it's the end of the world if something doesn't go exactly perfectly. So I think having that, yeah. You know, that, just to add to that, so, you know. Sure. We can control what we can control. So I always tell kids, you're going to strike yes. out. You know, if you get out three, you know, 10 out of, or seven out of 10 times, you're still a good player. You've got three, three mm -hmm. hits as a 300 hitter, which is very good. But I would tell yeah. them, look, there's a new statistic in baseball. It's hard hit balls. Meaning you, you can't control what happens to the ball once it leaves your bat. But, but get, so now they count. If you hit the ball hard, even though someone caught it, that's important. That's good. That's what we mm. want. Those, those are going to eventually drop. And so effort and attitude are two things that I always tell the kids. You can control those two things, and that's what I expect from you. The outcome, you know, you're going to make errors. Let's just make yeah. physical errors are going to happen. Mental errors, that's something that bothers me. You should be prepared. You should know balls hit to me, what I'm going to do in advance. So that's also within your control. Another thing that yep. I tried to put in the book, and I don't know if I got this right or not, but I feel like older people are sometimes invisible. We see them as mm. just some old person, like Billy Parks. I mean, Jimmy Parks was a former Major League Baseball player, a Hall of Famer in the top 10 home run leaders of all time. Yeah. But yet you just see an old guy. And yet, I, I don't know why, and that is where we don't sometimes we want to hear the, the stories. We want to know the background. We want to, who were you? What did you do? And, and who are you now? And not that we're trying to take from them because they would love, they love telling their stories and, and passing on what they've learned. But I think we almost don't take advantage of that. We see them as just an old person. And I, I don't know how to explain that, but maybe you could help me with that. I, I wanted to make him, like you said, yeah. he didn't tell anyone who he was. He, but we, which also led to him being invisible. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very tricky thing. I mean, definitely in American culture, at least from what I can tell, we certainly treat our older people in that kind of way, um, where we, you know, kind of put them somewhere else. They they move into a nursing home. They move into assisted living, whatever it might be, and and we might visit them every so often, but. You know, I, I remember I went on a trip to Korea, uh, uh, South Korea, a long time ago and got to do a homestay with a family. And that family had multiple generations living with it. And that's, from what I understand, very typical in a lot of other societies and cultures where you, know, you have that connection to your elders. You, you're, you're, they're venerated. Um, I, I remember in Korea, like the, the oldest person at the table was always served first. It was very like an honorable thing and you took care of that person. And, and yeah, that, that's just not as ingrained in our society for whatever reason. And so, yeah, I, I don't know if, I don't have an answer to that, but I, I wonder if that is, is a more uniquely American thing where we tend to, you know, push away or ignore, um, those people that are older than us. Well, in the book, I explained where they, there's an old guy baseball league. And so Jimmy becomes this coach of the team, but he pulls some of his other older former major leaguers to help. Mm -hmm. And the other parents and league officials and everyone thinks, look at these old guys. They're like almost like it's a joke. And then at the end of the season, they realize, wow, <laughs> could we, yeah. will you come and help coach my team? Uh, because they taught them more they knew more and taught them things that that only experience could help them to know and pass on yeah exactly so the lesson there is talk with your elders they are wise um all right well let's do a quick thunder round on that note and we'll wrap it up um so three quick questions here don't think too hard you ready Oh, yeah, I've been thinking about this. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Then I want rapid fire answers. What is your favorite food and or drink? Well, I'm going with baseball. So I'm going to say a hot dog and a soda at a ball game is heaven. There you go. Like it. Simple. Where's your favorite place you've ever been? 
I've been all over the world, Tahiti, Hawaii, Fiji. Yet when I was younger, I talked about throwing a ball against the wall all by myself. And I would go on a Saturday to a, 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 a like an industrial park with no one around. That sounds so like, really? Of all the place. But to me, that's, that's quiet solitude and being able to do something I love, which was throw a baseball, um, was heaven. There's two yeah, heavens. That sounds great, too. There you go. All right, last question. If you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? One of my books I wrote about a woman named Sunshine Blake who lived the most incredible life, and she came up with this theory. She said, what if? What if in the world, instead of being paid for making a good decision about a stock or doing uh, some sort of work that paid higher than something else, you got paid for your good deeds. The more good deeds you did, the more money you got. And the more money you got, you could still have a big house, but you would earn it by doing good things. And I thought, man, that would make our world so much better. That would be Yeah. Happy. Okay. I like that answer. Um, all right, Lee, thank you so much for joining me. I had uh, a great time talking with you on this Saturday afternoon. Um, the book, again, everyone, is Jimmy and the Kid. It's a great story, and it is a short novel for all ages, as we heard. Um, give it a shot. And Lee Silber, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Loved it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. <laughs>